Scotland's hospitals, there are some 400 of them, are now in the National Health Service. This film will show you some of the many facilities available in these hospitals and clinics in the new service in which they all play their part. In the past, they were managed by voluntary bodies, as at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, or by local authorities. Now they have been transferred to the Secretary of State for Scotland, on whose behalf they are administered by five regional hospital boards. The day-to-day -day running of the hospitals, however, is carried out much as before by local boards of management. The larger hospitals in the cities and big towns provide the more specialized forms of treatment and are also used as training schools for doctors and nurses. District hospitals can undertake the less highly specialized work. Country general hospitals are suited for people requiring long-term treatment, while the cottage hospitals serve the people in the neighborhood and are often used as clinics for consultation. Into this national system have come the seven hospitals which the Department of Health for Scotland built and administered during the war. By looking at three of these, we can get an idea of how hospitals can serve the community under a system of central administration. Here, on the braes of Balochmile, made famous by the song of Robert Burns, stands Balochmile House, purchased by the Department of Health in 1939. The bonny braes are almost treeless now, after wartime calls upon timber, and in the still beautiful grounds of the hospital, fewer greenwood echoes ring among the braes of Balochmile. Balochmile Hospital, which you see now, was completed late in 1940, in time to receive, along with the Law and Killern hospitals, the injured from the Clydeside Blitz of 1941. These hospitals were located in the country, far away from busy towns and danger areas, and from the beginning were used for men and women from the services and for the victims of air raids. In the months following D-Day, some 22,000 casualties were admitted to these emergency hospitals, and ambulance convoys like these were common sights. Between 1941 and 1945, several thousands of the sick and injured from the war factories and workshops were admitted to the department's hospitals. But even then, beds still stood empty. So the department opened the doors first to patients from the depressingly long waiting lists of the overburdened voluntary hospitals, and then, when the war had ended, to everybody. Today, under the new service, these hospitals are like other hospitals, part of a national organization. In each hospital, there are highly specialized departments. And should you need the assistance of any one of them, your doctor can get into direct touch with the medical superintendent of the hospital serving your area and arrange for your admission with the least possible delay. The more highly specialized the treatment, the more accurate the diagnosis must be. So, first-class equipment is needed. Here, in the X-ray department at Balloch Mile, is precision apparatus being used by skilled hands. And now, here is the result. What could not be seen or felt is now shown on the X-ray plate, and the diagnosis is discussed in a consultation between the radiologist and the clinical specialist. Should an operation be necessary, the surgeon must have at his command a wide range of instruments and apparatus. 
Here is one of the operating theatres at Balochmile Hospital, fully equipped for modern major surgery, typical of the facilities at all large hospitals. The operation you see is for acute appendicitis. Note the calm confidence of the skilled surgical team. You don't enjoy watching an operation. If you were the patient, you would know nothing of what was going on thanks to this ingenious anaesthetic apparatus. Note the movement of the knob below the bellows. It shows the rate and depth of the patient's breathing and enables the anaesthetist to control the anaesthetic with delicate precision. After an operation, the rigid care of the theatre is continued in the ward when changing dressings. For the nurse, the round of dressings is but one of the everyday tasks which are her contribution to the recovery of the patient. Balloch Mile Hospital has a unit devoted to plastic surgery. Here you see contracture of the fingers, the result of a burn which left the hand comparatively useless. After a simple skin grafting operation, the boy could use his hand again. This man's disfigurement was due to nitric acid burns. See him now after skin grafts on the forehead, eyelid and eyebrow and the fitting of an acrylic eye. Not so long ago, unsightly disfigurement caused some unfortunates to shut themselves away from their fellows. In others, Gross scarring produced ugly contractures and crippling deformities. By plastic surgery, many patients like this man are restored to normal life and usefulness. The dental department is specially equipped to deal with injuries to the mouth and jaw. To set a badly fractured jaw, the dentist first takes an impression. From this, metal splints are fashioned by the dental mechanic. The splints have been fitted over the patient's teeth and are now wired together and locked in position where they remain until the broken fragments of the jawbone have firmly united. But what about less spectacular ailments? Tonsillitis every winter, your nose always blocked, your hearing not what it was. Your doctor will probably suggest the consultation with an ear, nose and throat specialist. Here is one at work. Before advising treatment, he will make a full examination of throat and nose and ears. Only certain hospitals are fully equipped for this speciality, but there is bound to be one for your area to which your doctor can send you for diagnosis. Free provision of spectacles is one of the benefits under the National Health Service. Your doctor must certify that you need optical treatment and he may advise you to go to an optician, but he may wish you first of all to consult an oculist or ophthalmic surgeon at the local hospital. Here is an eye specialist examining a patient with an ophthalmoscope before prescribing the proper lenses to correct her vision. Stracathro Hospital is the subject of our next visit. It lies near Edsel on the fringe of the Grampians. The mansion house is occupied by the medical superintendent and other members of the senior staff. The wards are dispersed about the grounds. In the orthopedic department of this hospital, adjoining the operating theatre, is the plaster room, essential for the treatment of fractured or malformed limbs. Here, a plaster jacket is being applied for the treatment of a spinal injury. The patient's position is maintained by the support of straps from the roof, which take his weight. The early care of children suffering from spinal and other deformities, and especially the prevention of these deformities, 
is a pressing duty of the health service. Under expert medical and surgical care, this unfortunate young lady will eventually be straight and strong, like these healthy young specimens who are well on the way to complete recovery. Orthopaedic clinics try to ensure that by preventative as well as by curative measures, no child shall be condemned for life to be a cripple. Misshapen feet and legs must be treated as early as possible. One of the most successful methods of coaxing limbs into correct alignment is by the use of caliper splints. The metal supports are first welded by a technician working to the prescription of the orthopaedic surgeon. Afterwards, the framework is padded to give maximum comfort to the wearer. The finished article is now fitted to the patient and the straps carefully adjusted to ensure the correct tension and support. The first steps are tentative, but soon the initial awkwardness will be overcome and with practice, the patient will be able to walk with a fair degree of ease. This little boy is still at the awkward stage, but very soon he will be free of his splints and able to run about like his playmates. Strakathro Hospital, with its large orthopaedic department and a special unit for the treatment of rheumatism, has also a well-appointed physiotherapy department. Methods perfected during the war to secure the speediest possible return of injured workers to essential jobs are used to the full by highly trained staff. Remedial exercises too play a great part in strengthening weakened muscles and keeping healthy sinews active during convalescence. In the open air, when weather permits, or in the gymnasium, patients take part in games and movements skillfully designed to hasten their recovery. The dispensary must not be forgotten in our tour of the hospital. Here, the wards and theatres obtain their medical and surgical supplies and all hospital prescriptions are dispensed by the resident pharmacists. Most large hospitals have training schools for nurses. At Strakathro, over 100 students, 60% of them women, are studying for the state examinations. The sister tutor conducts her pupils through the course of the theory and practice of nursing, aided by the medical staff, who contribute by lectures and demonstrations. The students spend two-thirds of their time in school over periods of approximately three months, alternating with equal periods of practical work in the wards. The sister tutor is giving a revision lesson in anatomy before the state preliminary nursing examination. When you are not suffering, life is pleasant at Strakathro, especially in the summer when convalescents have the freedom of the grounds. Matron takes a personal interest in your recovery and you're made to feel a personality and not just a case. Various entertainments such as parties, dances, games and summer picnics are arranged by the welfare officer. Film shows are popular events with all who are well enough to walk or be wheeled into the hall. For our third and last visit, we go to Kilearn Hospital, situated at the foot of the Campsie Fells. Here are special units for brain surgery, peripheral nerve diseases and orthopaedics. By the way, note that although these hospitals are all placed well out in the country, there are good bus services to make visiting possible. Occupational therapy is one form of remedial treatment, 
And here you see patients working at various tasks calculated to restore limbs to normal function after injury or paralysis. In the workroom, weak muscles are strengthened by the movements required for weaving, rug making, carpentry and similar light occupations. The creative interest of these stimulates the mind as well as the body. The patient's progress is supervised by staff specially trained in this branch of treatment. The laboratory is an essential part of any important hospital. Here at Kilern is a well-equipped laboratory where you see the preparation of sections of a piece of tissue for examination under the microscope. These backroom people are constantly at work making their contribution to diagnosis and treatment by giving the physicians and surgeons information obtained from highly technical investigations. In these days of rationing, a big item in a modern hospital is to provide good food, well cooked and tastefully served for patients and staff. In the hospitals we have been visiting, the catering arrangements are the responsibility of the catering officer. A skilled dietitian attends to the special diets prescribed by the doctors for individual patients. Here is a well-appointed kitchen which can provide meals throughout the day. This one supplies over 2,000 meals every day to a strict timetable, beginning at 7 a.m. and ending at 8.30 in the evening. A night kitchen staff prepares meals for the night nurses and over 100 special diets are prepared each day. Here are some on their way to the wards to tempt the palate of invalids who are being coaxed back to health. Matron and medical superintendent work together to direct the affairs of the hospital. Under their immediate control are the nursing staff, of whom no particular mention has been made so far, although we have seen them going about their duties quietly and cheerfully in every department. At Kilern, Dalnea House, set in beautiful surroundings and three miles from the hospital, is used to house the night staff, who are conveyed to and fro by bus. Much consideration is given to the personal comfort of the nursing staff. Staff meals are served in this dining hall, sunny and always full of cheerful talk and laughter. In the sitting room, nurses can relax in their off-duty time, sewing, reading, solving crossword puzzles, or just chatting and listening to the radio. Like any woman, the nurse appreciates a room set aside for washing and ironing. And of course, the welcome cup of tea is not forgotten either. While Friday night becomes a pleasure under these modern conditions. For the nurse who is tired after her day's toil, here is a cosy bedroom where she can have privacy and a well-earned sleep.
This is the background to Kilern Hospital, but Balloch Mile and Strakathro Hospitals are in equally beautiful country settings. These three hospitals, which you have seen in some detail, were run by the department from early in the last war until they were handed over to the regional hospital boards. Under the National Health Service, these hospitals and all our hospitals, from the great city infirmaries to the small cottage hospitals, are working together to give the people of Scotland the best of skill and attention as a contribution to the physical and mental well-being of the nation.